Hey, Nathan, where did you just come back from? I just came back from Asheville, North Carolina, beautiful place, and I was reviewing the vehicle behind me, the 2023 or 2024, depending on which one it is, Dodge Hornet. Yep, and in this podcast, we're going to go deep into the Hornet. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, what a new car for Dodge means because it's been years. It's been years since they've had a new car. Uh, and since you got your hands on it, uh, we're going to go talk about that as well. But before we do that, I've got some, uh, I've got a rant I want to talk about. Does it have to do with rashes? No, nothing. Or chafing? No. Okay. No. It has to do with PR, Nathan. Public relations. Yeah, yeah. And it has to do with uh, the lessons that automakers are learning from Tesla, believe it or not. Okay. So uh, there's, this, there's this disturbing trend that I'm seeing uh, that uh, I think is short-sighted and I think is um, uh, problematic. I'll tell you what. Um, you know, we've been doing this for 13 years, right? Mm -hmm. And part of our job uh, is working with some fantastic people in the PR departments of all these different companies. Some of them are absolutely amazing. And what's been, what's been worrying me is I've seen the turnover – increasing recently. So a lot of our friends that we work with at various companies are now either out of jobs or moving to new jobs. Yeah. And in some cases, they're bringing in uh, PR companies to replace them, especially if they're entrenched in the uh, automaker. And, and the reason I bring Tesla into this conversation is because uh, Tesla does not have a PR department. No, they don't. They got rid of it. And uh, so let's talk about kind of the lessons that Tesla has taught the manufacturers. And, and I think you know, some have been good and some have been really bad. Uh, and I'll give you the example of good ones and then right, we'll give please. you an example of bad ones, right? So good lessons that Tesla has taught uh, traditional, dare I say, legacy car companies is, for instance, over-the-year updates. That's great. That, that, but that's a tech thing. That's, that's product. Right. But, right. But these are things that companies eventually picked up, right? Sure. So over-the-year updates, really great thing. You don't have to bring your car to the dealership. Just takes care of itself. Does, fixes itself, updates itself. Loved it. We had that Tesla Model 3 that actually became faster overnight one mm -hmm. night where it got uh, more um, horsepower because, you know, the battery management system worked differently via an over-the-air update. Good. Here's a bad one. Mm. Uh, once again, this is, um, you know, tech stuff, but it is a bad one. Uh, Door handles, recessed door handles. Yeah, I hate those. And, and they're not very good in cold weather. No. No. No, they're, they're, they're not very good in cold weather. All right, here, here's, here's another good one. Okay. Um, direct sales. Yeah, yeah. I, I do like that we've done it before. We've done it three times. And yeah. it worked quite well all three times. Yeah, I get, taking the middleman, you know, the dealership out of it uh, yeah. allows um, Tesla to be much more nimble, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, much more. Uh, what I mean by nimble is they, you know, they, the prices go up and down, but they do it much quicker than most traditional car companies. It's non-haggling. What you see is what you get, and um, essentially, you, they, you know, you they bring the car to you. All right here's another. Here's a bad one. Mm. Uh, the yoke. The yoke is a joke. <laughs> it is a joke. Yeah. <laughs> but Lexus has adopted it. <laughs> yes, they have. And then they're going to get rid of it the first time you know one of the cars slams into a wall because it's drive-by wire in that Lexus. And I guarantee you someone's going to blame, well, the yoke actually made it hard for me to turn. And boom, it's going to be gone. And, and Tesla is actually fixing some of those problems by having bringing back the steering wheel as an option in those vehicles. Yeah, because they because people hate them. People because they, people hate them. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's another good one. Mm. Before we get to the bad one, uh, buying your car online. You know, configuring it online and just buying it and then you know picking it up or having it delivered to you. Right? They created a model that a lot of other people are following now, and for good reason. And, and even and, dealerships. Yeah, and well, in some cases, well, they're, they're they're all getting the message, which is especially during COVID, and people are like, hey, I'm totally happy just ordering the car this way. Um, it works quite well. Yeah, and here's the one that we're going to be talking about that's the, kind of the topic of my rant, and that mm -hmm. is getting rid of their PR department. Stupidest thing ever. Absolutely just, uh, you know, one, one guy, one guy who was a big Tesla fan was like, well, it's really ballsy of them because that way they don't have to respond to your criticism. Uh, well, there's a problem with that, and that is if there's recalls, if there's new advancements in the vehicle, if there's new... Anything with the vehicle and you're looking outside your pool of fanboys and you want to actually talk to the public, you can't. Also, if we have a question and we're able to go to any automaker other than them and say, hey, listen, it was rumored that this is happening or this recall is happening. Give us some numbers or, you know, the actually important, pertinent technical information that you guys need, we can't get. 
Yeah, so I'll give you a perfect example of that. The first thing you said was recalls, right? Mm -hmm. So this week the news was that uh, Tesla had to recall. Actually, there was an investigation by the National Highway Traf Traffic Safety Administration that um, Model Ys were losing their steering wheels while people were driving them. Actually, <laughs> yeah, coming off. <laughs> yeah, coming yeah. off because they had forgotten to install a bolt. Yeah. Now, that story is out there now. And, you know, you read the stories and you say, we contacted Tesla and they didn't get back to us. So now you've got, you know, all these people reading about, like, you know, the steering wheel coming off in their hands while they're driving the car, which is about as bad of a thing. That I couldn't think of a worse thing. It's, it's pretty bad. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of vehicles. We're not talking about a couple that could be affected. Yeah. And, and you, you contact Tesla and Tesla has no narrative to replace the narrative that basically they forgot to uh, tighten steering wheels. And so what ends up happening in the zeitgeist of the uh, buyer, Teslas now are associated with steering wheels that fall off. I, I mean, that... And, it, and, and burning, and cars burning. Yeah. That in itself, right, will keep people from buying a Tesla. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'd be like, you know, I was thinking about a Tesla, but, you know, a, a steering wheel fell off. Gosh. Well, I appreciate the fact that you prefaced everything by showing some of the positives that Tesla provides. Plus, some of their tech and some of their vehicles are fantastic. We're showing you in the news. We actually try to be unbiased about these things. But frankly speaking, when you're being ass stupid like Tesla is about their PR department and not communicating with the people out there, including us, then you're blowing it. You're, you're, God only knows what they were thinking when they did this. It's not like they can't afford to have five people running a PR department, for crying out loud. Yeah, but I, I'm seeing like traditional companies now with our friends being laid off or being let go following that route. And that is just Potentially such, following that, that route. You know, you could, you could see like somebody at corporate saying, hey, if we eliminate these five PR jobs, then we'll save whatever it is, a half a million dollars. And I couldn't think of a more stupid, more short-sighted, more um, um, silly policy to, to hold in place. Because the, the thing is, you know, we as traditional journalists, and we're not influencers, by the way. No, the hell with we, that. Traditional journalists, yeah. You know, try to tell both sides of the story, right? That's kind but, of the but, point. But if 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 there's no other side of the story to tell because there is no PR department, then the story just simply becomes Tesla Model Y steering wheels have fallen off in people's hands while they were driving them down the street, and that becomes a narrative because you have no other counter narrative. There's no facts that you can tell us because you don't reply to our emails, and I think it comes from kind of this arrogance that is part and parcel of internet companies, Nathan. Yeah, I You know what agree. I mean? I mean, yeah. like Facebook, Google, you, you pick the company, right? Yeah. And there's nobody you can talk to at these companies. Nobody. It's like they, they, they don't seem to care about their customers, which are the people who use, use their products. Unfortunately, with automotive products, there's a lot of competition. There is a lot of competition, and lives are at stake. I'm sorry to say it that way, but it's true. And if you're waiting for a text to come from your God and Savior saying, well, we have that, we have a fix for that, and stay tuned for that, that's not how you communicate with everybody. And by letting media know, rather than just going over to you know Twitter and saying, oh, okay, well, there was a mention of this here, that doesn't cover the whole point. There are numbers that actually are contacted through the NHTSA, which, by the way, if we ever find reports out there on that, we always put up there on our websites so you guys have the resources to go and contact and find out whether or not your car is affected. But there's more to it. It has to do with everything down the line, and that's why the PR department does have a reason to be. Now, look, we don't get along with all PR departments. Subaru is a really good example of a horrible PR department, but I'm glad they still have one at least so they can talk to other people. But the bottom line is this. If you don't have a PR department, your communication skills are being screwed. And by continuing to do this, if this is a trend, you're going to hurt your own company and you're going to hurt the people who buy your vehicles. Yeah, and, and it's actually, you, you're, you're starting to see the, the, the downside to not having a PR department. Because look, obviously with Tesla, you had this bombastic or you have this bombastic CEO mm -hmm. who was both the marketing and the PR department all in one, right? Yeah, it yeah. all comes from him, right? So the way that Tesla sold cars was instead of having commercials, which is, is was kind of brilliant, right? They would do things like put fart mode in the car. They got social media buzzing about, hey, look, I, you know, you could, I could make my mom fart when she, you know, turns left, right? Yeah, yeah. right? Or, or, and there was a whole bunch of these kind of things that the Teslas did. Which was that, a lot of fun. That they got, you know, that were very tweetable or Facebookable or video makeable, right? right? Uh, but... The key there is you have to have this kind of bombastic CEO who then becomes the face of the company. Most car companies do not have bombastic CEOs, right? Most most CEOs are are people who are kind of 
um, like not like Steve Jobs or, or, or Musk. They're more, you know, caretaker CEOs, right? Because the company's been around a long time and their job is just to keep the train moving down the tracks. You know, at the end of the day, the CEO represents thousands and thousands of people and represents the people who are interested in the product. They have to have a certain type of button-down personality that can work within all of them and be a proper representative. Look, I'm not going to go on a rant about Elon Musk. I don't care. And I'm not going to help increase or de decrease his viewership based on my opinion. But I will say this. A lot of people out there who are way up there on their high and mighty peak do not bother looking down at the people that they're stepping on. That's, that's the bottom line for me. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, you know, if you don't have that kind of bombastic CEO, uh, then that strategy is not going to work for you. And the other thing I would point out is there's a reason that companies have PR departments, right? Mm -hmm. it, they didn't just like they, they didn't like come part and parcel when Ford started, right? Right. Bad things happened at Ford. You know, you can think back to the Henry Ford days, right, where where, <laughs> where people got beat up, unions got busted, oh, and I... all of a sudden the company wanted to tell its side of the story. So they said, you know what, we need to be able to tell our side of the story, not just the other side of the story. They became much more transparent, that's for sure. And, and, and you know, taking this kind of approach where, you know, we don't, care about our customers enough to actually have a department that answers to to the people who try to represent their customers because that's our job right in, in a way because we have this outlet mm -hmm. um, and we know that's our job because we get emails from you every day when companies don't respond to your gripes or your problems every or day, your guys. yeah every day yeah. And, and then we hopefully because we have a much larger audience take up that mantle and hopefully you know bring attention to problems that, that that may be getting swept under the rug but when there's no PR department then all that the company is saying is we don't care about our customers that's that's right. basically what Tesla is saying we do not care about our customers enough to actually have people to answer the questions that that people representing our customers may have and I know I'm gonna get a lot of crap from the Tesla fanboys and right. fangirls out there but um, but, you know. but, but no you're right I mean prove him wrong that, that's that's pretty much it. Okay, let's we're going around and around on this. Yeah, okay. We're, we're, let's, we're repeating let's, let's this. Let's talk about the Hornet. Okay, now first of all, uh, many of you may be wondering why is the Hornet a big deal? The Hornet, by the way, many of you might be thinking, well, where that name comes from the past. Yeah, AMC. If you remember back in the day, they had a Hornet. But there's a lot of other uh, insect uh, <laughs> references that um, FCA and now Stellantis is using. <laughs> Um, so just just keep that in mind. That's all part I mean, of the what, video. What other cars are named after insects? Well, they have you know honeybees and stingers. No, they had, they had the what was the bee? They had the uh, they had the bee something the, the old muscle car with the little bee on the side. What yeah, yeah, that? that's uh, the, the bee. The uh, the rumble bee. Rum, yeah, wasn't uh, it the rumble bee? No, it wasn't the rumble bee. It was something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Correct us if I'm wrong, but there was. I a just, I'm not a big fan of, 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 of insects and little little animals and cutesy things. Although they did a pretty good job with hornet, kind of scary, especially when you think of murder hornets. And we'll is get it, there. Is there a fly? No, there's no fly. There's no fly, but uh, there's there's caterpillar. No. Yeah, there is a large company called Caterpillar that actually moves right. Earth. Yeah, but, but that's, they're not in the car world. No, not really. Hmm. Um, it's been many, many years since Dodge has actually produced a new vehicle. Now, think about it. I know you're like, well, wait a minute. What about these, these new last call ones? No, 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 no. I'm talking about actual new car. And this is a new car for Dodge. The last one that they had that was new was many years ago, and that was the Dodge Dart, which, to be honest with you, did not go over particularly well. It, it, it was a bit of a dud. Now, fast forward over seven years, I think, um, to today. The Dodge Hornet, there's two different types. So there's the Rumblebee was a pickup truck. Rumblebee was a pickup truck. Pickup okay. truck, yeah. Um, anyway, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I just, so had a, I had you just a, totally I, threw me off. I know, sorry. So there's two different uh, Hornets. There's the GT and there's the RT, and they are very different vehicles. Um, currently, if you look at the large batch of vehicles out there, I hope you're sitting down because this is what this car is going to be competing against. And it's very interesting, the path that Dodge is taking. They're going up against the Honda HRV, the Toyota Corolla Cross, the Chevy Trailblazer, the Mazda CX-30, the Hyundai Kona, the Kia Seltos, the Jeep Renegade, the Subaru Crosstrek, among others. And in their price, where they're living in terms of price, they're also competing against more expensive vehicles, including their own vehicle, the Alfa Romeo Tonale, which 
is the platform that this car is based on. Yeah, that, you know, that, uh, I'm going to call it uh, compact crossover segment is mm -hmm. really red hot right now. Oh, super hot. Yeah. It, yeah. It's been hot for years, but it it's has. really... It has really heated up. There's two segments in the automotive world that have gotten really hot recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that because Tommy just went on a program for another one of them. Uh, and, you know, this is the sub kind of compact uh, uh, crossover segment, and the three-row is red hot right now, too. Yeah, yeah, it Both is. Both those segments are just... Anything that's non-truck... These two segments are the ones. And if you think about the size of the uh, Hornet, it, it actually it sort of slots in between the compact and subcompact. So if, when I mentioned Honda HRV, it could also cut, go against the Honda CRV to a certain degree, yeah, even though the CRV is bigger. And I was just uh, previewing the new uh, Kona, mm -hmm. and they made it a few inches bigger. And a few inches wider, so it's also now kind of lives between that. So it, it, it lives between like the HRV and the CRV, which is exactly why I put it on this list. Yeah, yeah. or the Cross Cor Corolla Cross and the uh, Rav Four, right? Mm -hmm. Somewhere in between in terms of size. Exactly, but but that whole segment when you combine them all together sells millions of vehicles every year, and many of us just are done with the idea of being in you know low slung sporty sedans or, or you know the equivalent. These are much more popular. And essentially what you're talking about here with both the Dodge uh, Hornet RT and GT is essentially a hot hatch on stilts. That's exactly what this is. Now, I can't tell you what the driving impressions are yet. That happens on the 22nd of the month. But I can tell you everything else about these two cars. All right. Well, um, let's start with something basic. Uh, and I know we can't talk about driving impressions. Mm. What do you think of the styling? Well, the styling is interesting. Uh, they put us through the studio and all the rigor more of, you know, talking to the guys who style it and whatever. Um, it looks like a Dodge from the front and from the back. And that's because what they did is the squinty eye look that looks very similar to the ch uh, Charger. And, of course, its big brother, the Durango, right in the front and in the back. If you look at the rear taillight design, it's very similar to a Durango, just smaller. But from the side view, it's... And I, I'm sorry to be mean about it, but it's as uninteresting as a Honda HRV or any of the other vehicles. Mm. So it's just it's really hard to make kind of rounded a, off box. Right. It's it's really hard to make a crossover look good from the side. Um, that they have different wheel designs. They're all decent. I, black wheels to me always seem to remove the emphasis of the cool design of the actual wheel, and you almost lose it in the image. If you guys are able to watch what we're doing right now behind me, that image, those are black wheels. There's two different, there's actually three different sizes of black wheels that are out there with this vehicle, and none of them look interesting because you can't see them. So that's a different but thing. But that's right a there. trend right now, right? Black, it is. Black, I, I'm looking at the picture, and yeah. the grill's blacked out, the wheels are blacked out. Well, down. actually, this is a special track, this is a special edition that has the blacked out okay. like on a top of everything edition. else. Right, which is why if you can barely see it, but that little hornet on the side there on the fender, that's blacked out as well. So, you know, scary, blacked out, you know, ooh. I'm just glad they don't put tape over their taillights to make them look, you know, like they're blacked out as well. Let's talk about the two different vehicles that are out there because they're two completely different personalities, two completely different yeah, vehicles. Yeah, tell me, about, tell me about the, you drew, you drew both of them and those yes, videos will be coming. And actually there are videos on all TFL right now. Yeah, there's two hey, videos now. Hey guys, if you're listening to this podcast and I know I was watching, um, the Daily Show, uh, and uh, they had a they had a, a report with Marcus Brownlee about technology and how technology is making our lives worse. Um, and uh, one of the things that they pointed out is that everybody now has their favorite form of like where they get their content, right? Somebody, got, somebody, you know, like if you want to talk to somebody, you got to message her on Facebook. If somebody else, you got to go to WhatsApp, right? Somebody mm. else, you got to go. That's true. There's a lot of different. There's ones. a lot of different ones, uh, and that's why we created all TFL.com because I'm seeing comments like. You know, recently at TFL Car, we did a bunch of in-studio videos and people are like saying, those are boring, I want to see reviews. And like today, we published four videos, three of them were reviews, they just happened not to be on TFL Car. Mm -hmm. So if you guys want a review, head on over to all TFL and you'll see that we are publishing regular drive reviews. Nathan's two videos are up there. One's on car and one's on now. Oh, well, yeah, but yeah. it's all in one place. I, I, know, I know I'm asking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason why we have so many channels is because there's so much to choose from out there. And if we if we just had, two, let's say, two channels, car and truck, we'd have to stack up five reviews in a day sometimes. And you guys wouldn't be able to get to all of them or it would be really hard to because you wouldn't see them in your inbox. This way it makes it a lot easier. That's why we have all these channels. And you can, you can save it as a little app to your phone. So mm -hmm. then all you do is click. That's what I do in the morning. I just click and I see all the stories that we've published. Yeah. Uh, it, it's actually very handy. And I know, I'm, like I said, I'm asking a lot for you to 
go to a different website, but save it to your phone and you'll have it there and you'll see that we're doing everything we've always been doing. It's just, you know, all in one place. I love to give people choice, right? My thing has always been, let's give our, uh, let's give our fans and our, our viewers and our listeners and our readers choice. And that, that's what all TFL does. You can pick whatever stories you want. There just isn't an algorithm that's feeding it to you like TikTok, which mm. is maybe a problem, Nathan. All right, so tell me about the two cars. Well, first of all, let me start with this. Yep. For years, you guys have been lied to. Lied to, I say. Okay. Because what they've been calling these vehicles, crossovers, is sport utility vehicles. Indeed, they are utility vehicles, but rarely are they sport. Mm, I that. am not kidding. Think about it this way. If you look at all of the vehicles that are out there right now that are fun to drive, and I put sport and fun to drive in the same category, there's only a couple that really exist that are less than 50 grand. And uh, for instance, a really good one, the Mazda CX-30 with the turbocharged engine, that thing uh, I feel, and uh, some of the other people here at the studio feel, is one of the best. In fact, I got it from some Dodge Insiders that they actually benchmarked that vehicle in terms of its performance. Hmm. And rightfully so, it's, it's a beast. So that particular vehicle to me is the very top of it. And that's the closest you're gonna get to the sport in utility vehicle, right? Dodge wants to push that aside and give you a whole new understanding of it. Are you, are you telling me this is the uh, Parasengue, the Ferrari Parasengue of uh, under $50,000 crossovers? To a certain degree, yes. <laughs> They're like, do you know, like 32, like literally like 32 videos of the new uh, Ferrari uh, sport utility yeah. hit the internet today. And everybody's saying that it's not a crossover, that it's the Ferrari of crossovers. So maybe this, um, is this the Ferrari of crossovers? No, it's not because okay. the Ferrari of crossovers already exists. In the, and by the way, in the same, technically Stellantis has some interest in Ferrari. Uh, no, no. I'm going to say that this is instead of the Ferrari. They used, own, they used to own Ferrari. Yes, they did. But I will say this is very similar to the Alfa Romeo of, wait a minute, oh, oh I just, by the way, they don't like it. Uh, the Dodge people were a little ticked off when we were asking, so based on the platform of the Tonale, and they're like, no, 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 hey, we don't talk about other people. This is our car, not their, you know, that type of thing. So, Hey, let's uh, pay some bills real quick. Let's do that. All right, so tell me about right. the two cars. All right, first of all, there's the GT. The GT is essentially the entry-level car. There's no base engine that's weak or mild. No, 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 no. They have a two liter turbocharged engine. This is standard that gives you 268 horsepower, 295 pound feet of torque, and it's going through a nine speed automatic transmission and standard all wheel drive. This is what you get right out of the box. And according to them, it is the most powerful crossover in its class for under 30 grand. Now, realistically, you're not gonna get it for that because once you add destination, everything else, you're coming close to 32. I went on the configurator, which is live now for at least the GT, and yeah, 33 realistically is what it's gonna cost to get the absolute base model with the anemic looking wheels, but you still get the powertrain. And I can't go over how good that is driving. However, I can say that they've worked with this powertrain before and it's been massaged not for off-roading, but for street. So it has a power takeoff that that's, basically that's disassembles, GT. Yeah. you know, and it'll put up to 50% of the power to the rear wheels. There is some torque vectoring going on based on the braking as well. So it will make sure that you maintain the best type of traction around corners. According to them, they make this car a on-road car that can handle inclement weather. Okay, so What's it about in terms of size and everything else? It's actually a slightly larger vehicle than many of its competitors on the inside. So 22.9 cubic feet of carbon space behind the second row, over 55 when you fold down the seats. That's comparable to many in the class and better than many. So it's kind of right in the middle, but it's a little less than say the Toyota Corolla Cross. But the Toyota Corolla Cross has a 169 horsepower uh, engine. <laughs> so think about it that way. And also, this has that nine speed. It doesn't have a CVT. A lot of competitors have CVTs. So that's the GT, right? That's your base form. All right, let me ask you this before we move on. Mm -hmm. Do you like the name? So I'll tell you a little story um, that happened to us. Super B. That's the name of the Dodge. Super B. Very good. Yeah. I know, Super loud. B. Sorry, guys. Not <laughs> enough coffee in me yet. Yeah. And there's a, was there a wasp, too? Was there a wasp or no? Uh, no, but there are many people who are wasps who <laughs> are, Oh, no. Sorry. Go on. I'm just trying to come up with, like, insect names of cars. It's Now it's stuck in my head. Like, what other <laughs> cars are named after insects? There's, I don't think there's any ants. Uh, no. Or cockroaches, strangely. A spider? 
Scorpion. Scorpion, spider. How about the, I mean, spiders. spiders. Yeah, yeah they're, well, but that's spiders. S P Y D E R, right? It's, it's a type of convertible, thing. right? The Audi spider. Well, the English spell tire with a Y. Who cares? It's fine. Uh, all right. All right. So let me tell you a story uh-huh. now that I brought it up. So maybe a half a dozen years ago, uh, I was at the Chicago Auto Show and I was talking to one of the PR people, thank God. Uh, <laughs> And uh, they had the Dodge Dart there, and it wasn't named the Dart yet, right? It was, it was, it was like um, no, they had the Julia there. This, so right. what what happened was that um, FCA at the time uh, was a conglomeration of Fiat and of Dodge Ram, Chrysler, Chrysler, mm-hmm. Alfa Romeo. Uh, and Ferrari. Ferrari, which, by the way, you were right. They, they eventually spun Ferrari off. Mm-hmm. So there's a connection. But anyway, uh, I was talking to the PR guy, and they were, they were pointing to the car, and they said to me, um, you know, we're taking the Julia and basically turning it into uh, an American version that you can buy. And I was over the moon because mm-hmm. I had never actually driven the Julia, but, but uh, you know, I had seen it in pictures. It looked just like pure sex in motion, right? Yeah, Especially in that Russo car. red, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I was so excited, so excited. And then I think what happened was we got a little package in the mail uh, from our friend Wendy at the time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, when she worked there. Yeah, and uh, it had a little dartboard or something, remember? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that was like, hey, guys, just want to give you a heads up. No, it had, a, it had a dart. It had a dart. An actual yeah, physical a dart. dart yeah. that yeah. was magnetic or something. Uh, yeah, and that's how they kind of announced the name. Mm-hmm. And already we were like, eh, I'm not sure that's a great idea to bring My back. My brother a had a dart. Exactly. It was a late 60s dart with a slant six. Now, I know they had more powerful ones, but for the most part, darts were associated with kind of old man stodgy... You know, think of Roman in 10 years type thing, yelling at people, oh, he's got his cane. I, I don't know. I just, darts never really no, sung to me. No, dart, darts were like, like, they were like the parts bin car that they built to be affordable and it's just a yeah. runabout. And same with the duster, right? I mean, there are like cool versions of them, but, and there are people who at like. At least the duster has a little bit more of a. A, a little bit of a act, cojones. Active name to yeah. it, you know. But, but, the, uh, but the dart was, ne- and I know that because one of my best friends loves darts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he works for NASA and he's a complete geek, right? This is, not that there's oh, anything. Him, yeah. Yeah, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it doesn't appeal to like the mass. <laughs> the name definitely fell flat on its face, and it it was it was kind of a harbinger for what was about to happen. Yeah. So fast forward, and we where do we we were like in Tennessee or someplace? No, Texas. Texas was a Texas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. We go because to, we we couldn't find places to shoot. Right. There was no real. Uh, no, none of the roads we were on were straight. We couldn't do a proper zero to sixty, and there were curvy roads, and it was so, very difficult. So, to so, so they fly us to Texas, and I remember at that time there were like 14 vehicles in that midsize sedan, right? Yeah. So it was competing with cars like the Ford Fusion, and let's be let's give. Uh, a little bit of credit where credit is due. Uh, I mean, the Dart died not just because I don't think they got it right. I think it also died because that whole segment died. Yeah. Right? There's and, three, I think there's three cars left and in that I segment. Will, I'm going on record saying I didn't hate it. There were things I liked quite a bit about it. Yeah, you know, like, so So the way I, I look at cars, and I think this is a good way to judge them, is, is what's the headline of the story, right? Mm-hmm. If there's a good headline because they've done something new, which is what Tesla does so well, by the way, uh, then, then, then there's a hook to hang it on, mm-hmm. and you, could, you kind of feel like, okay, this is un- unique and unusual. But I, I, the only headline that uh, I could think about the Dart, and, and think about it. So the Dart was a midsize. It wasn't much bigger. It wasn't much smaller than any other ones. It was mm. kind of right in the middle of the segment. Uh, it did bring all-wheel drive, right? You could get a Dart with all-wheel drive, if I remember right. There was an all-wheel drive one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay, I don't remember that. I remember there are two different engines. There was the more powerful one, the less powerful one. The lesser powerful one gave you a six. Or maybe it didn't have all wheel drive, but like like in that segment, I like don't. the Fusion had all wheel drive. You can yes, get it. the Fusion did. Uh, the Legacy had all wheel drive, right? So that was unique. Yeah. Uh, and then like the Volkswagen uh, Passat had the largest back seat room, right? So you could stretch out your leg. But there was always something. It went against the Jetta more than the Passat. I no, think. the Jetta. Yeah, the yeah. Jetta. Same thing, right? Yeah. Had the largest like pass, and they still do that. Volkswagen still does it with the Taos, right? It's got mm-hmm. the most back seat leg room. That's still their thing. But I couldn't think of anything that made it stand up above and beyond the segment. That, that was a compelling reason for somebody to be like, you know what? I need this, and the Dart is the only thing that has it. And so then it becomes about price. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was, it was priced competitively. And at first when they were showing, you know, us the vehicle, they were also talking about a lot of aftermarket or in market 
features that they would provide and the car to be super unique. And it had some unique features. Like, for instance, it had this underseat storage in the passenger seat where it, lit, it went forward and you can store stuff in there, which was great. But unfortunately, the passenger seat was not the most comfortable, I think, because it didn't allow it to have too much foam. Yeah, I don't think it had all-wheel Backs- drive. I'm, I'm Googling it. I think it had front-wheel drive. It was front-wheel drive. Yeah. Um, Backseat space was decent, but headroom wasn't so great. You know, I mean, there's all these little things, bit, pretty big trunk. But it didn't do anything that was particularly spectacular, it, and it, that was part of the problem. It had one unique feature. Do you remember what that was? Manual transmission was available. And it was a good one. No, one one really unique feature that I haven't seen in any other car. Uh, told, I'll give seat. you a hint. Yeah, what? The seat. Yeah, what about the seat? It pulls forward, and you can put stuff in it. Yes, yeah, the seat. I, I just said that. Did you? Yeah, you weren't listening. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I was trying to Google whether there was. you got to turn it up a little bit. <laughs> right. it, it, you could, you could, there was like, the center cushion you can lift up, and there was like a little... Not the center. Cubby the, hole. The, the front cushion. Yeah, the yeah. front cushion. Yeah. It, but in, I think in the center of the front, you could like open yeah, it up. Yeah, like the, it, it, yeah. It tipped yeah. forward and you could open it and put stuff in There's actually put, a pretty good space in there. You put but, your, your Bible or gun in there. But the problem was is that because of that, you weren't, it, it didn't have the comfort of the regular seat because they have less padding. There's a door there. There's no longer right. padding. Like GM does that with the back of the seat. The back of the seat is, yeah. is better. It's better placement. So anyway, bottom line, the, the dart... Um, wasn't terrible. I didn't mind its looks either, by the way. I thought it was actually kind of attractive, especially when guys put nicer wheels and tires on it. But the bottom line is that it just didn't compete at the level of the other ones. And look what Ford did with their Fusion. Decent car, lots of different options, gone. Why? Because they felt that most people want crossovers and trucks. And they're, they're actually right. They've been proven correct. So Dodge got rid of that. And that was their last new car before the Hornet. So I'm going to continue with the Hornet? Yes, please. Okay, all right. So we talked about the GT and its entry level and its entry level price. Now, by the way, that GT, not that efficient. Combined MPG, 24 miles per gallon. That is not the worst in class, but it certainly isn't the best in class. It's it's near the very, very bottom. Obviously, because you have that turbocharged engine with all that horsepower. And this is Dodge's point. They're saying, we're not building an economy car. We're building a very muscular car. And with these horsepower numbers, that's not a surprise. Now, let's move on to something that even produces more power. Now, it has a 1.3 liter four-cylinder engine. Tiny little turbocharged four-cylinder engine. But it has electric motors backing it up. And that's the RT. The RT is a plug-in hybrid. has a 15 0.5 0.5 kilowatt hour battery, which is stored in the back near the gas tank. Don't worry about it. It's not going to be an issue. <laughs> Just please don't worry. Um, but what that does is that also creates much better balance. It's 48% weight in the back, 52 in the front, which for crossovers usually is actually quite good. Normally, a lot more weight is up front on these uh, vehicles. And one of the reasons why it has a lot of weight in the back is because, well, here's the horsepower numbers, 288 horsepower, but more importantly, torque. 383 pound-feet of torque. Wow. That, that is enormous for a vehicle like this. However, because it's a hybrid, it is heavier than the Dart G, or, well, I said Dart, the uh, Hornet GT, uh, by about 400 pounds. So it has two things that makes it heavier. One, the hybrid system, hence the battery hooked up some other electronics. And unlike the Hornet GT, Similar to Toyota products that are hybrids with all-wheel drive, it has an electric rear drive. So essentially, there's an electric motor back there powering the rear wheels. And that also can do a 50-50 split, and it does torque vectoring. And that does something very special. What's that? It has what's called the power shot. Okay. Isn't that great? You have to say it that way. The power shot. That sounds like some kind of a watermelon shot at a football Uh, game. That's what they want you to think is like, yeah. So the power shot is a very special um, component to this vehicle, which is all based on that electric rear end I was talking about. So you're at your regular horsepower thing and you want to go a little bit faster for 15 seconds. You pull on both paddles. It has paddle shifters. Just the RT, the the GT doesn't have paddle shifters. And what that'll do is if you're in the right mode, which is a sport mode, it'll actually allow you to use the power shot once the indicator comes on and you get 30 extra horsepower for up to 15 seconds. So you know who else does that, right? Hyundai with their N cars, right? They have the Engren, right. right, which does a similar thing. And there's a little counter that counts you down. I don't think it's, I think it's only 10 seconds with those. Not too sure to be and honest it, and with it's, you. Yeah, and it's not, I don't think it's 30 horsepower. 30 horsepower is actually, you can feel that. It's quite a shot. It's quite a shot in yeah. terms of the numbers, but I can't tell you how it feels. Yeah. Yeah. 20 second, you'll be able to hear how it feels. And here's the good news about that. It doesn't just work um, as you're driving. It also works off the line, kind of like a primitive form of um, 
what's your call it? Uh, you know, when you hit a button, you uh, no, uh, launch control. Launch control. Yeah. Thank you. God. Um, so, so tell me about the interior. How is the interior? interior on both of them is is Dodge like? So, if you look at uh, the current Dodge Charger or Challenger, or even for that matter, the, um, the, the Durango Sea of Black. It, no, no, let's get to the dash, actually. Right. The dash design is kind of a, it looks kind of like an homage to the older cars. This is similar to that. And yes, there's a lot of black in there, but they also break it up with a lot of stitching and contrasting stitching that is standard, by the way. Um, and then if you go up to the up higher models, the st uh, stitching changes colors. And there's four or five, I think there's four different seat designs including a couple different leather designs. The good news is the seats can be gray with red. There's two different types of red seats that are available, so you can actually get an interior that's partially red, like Dodge does on a lot of their other hot vehicles. Just, just, you can get that. Just so before they put the comments, you said Amish to the other people. Homage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I not pronounce, did I say Amish? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Homage. Homage. <laughs> that's, that's Amish. The word we're looking did for. I say Amish? Which, which I am so a, sorry. Which would I, be a whole different thing. I wasn't, I seriously was not trying to be rude about it. <laughs> Damn you English for saying that. <laughs> so, uh, so, do you like it? I can't say that, right? Because, but I can tell you. Well, I can tell you about the interior and the exterior design. Yes. Yeah, I mean that's not a driving it's, it's, impression. It's, it's nice. The seats in the top of the line, full out version that you get with all the options, which is well over fifty thousand dollars. By the way, you can get a fifty two, fifty three thousand dollars if you throw all the options in it, and suddenly that is a very expensive vehicle for its class. But you also get these ridiculous power numbers. You get the plug-in hybrid. By the way couple things. Plug-in hybrid system, you can drive it for up to 30 miles on a single charge, but it doesn't have fast charging, hmm. so you can only do level two. However, from all the way empty to all the way full, they say is in or around or possibly under 2.5 hours, or if you plug it into your 120 at home, about seven hours to charge it all the way up. Um, and I did drive it a little bit on electrical, but honestly, I was just like, no, I need all the power. I want to have some fun. And it is a very heavy vehicle when you compare it to its little brother. As I said, 400 pounds of extra load. That's a lot, despite these power numbers. Uh, a couple other things real quick. Um, 2,000 pounds both vehicles can tow when properly equipped, which is as good, if not best in class for most of these vehicles, especially considering that it's a performance one. Dual exhaust tips that are actually functional on the RT. Thank you, because I can't stand the fake ones. Um, and the overall design of the vehicle underneath, everything under the skin essentially comes from the Alfa Romeo Tonale. Okay, and uh, when will it be available? So right now, the GT is available or will be available by the time you see this or hear this. And that's because even online you can do ordering uh, and there will be more information coming very shortly about the GT. The RT is going to be a little bit later in spring. They're still sorting things out. Like, I don't even know what the EPA numbers are officially. I mean, you can get 90 MPGE, they say, but that doesn't tell you guys anything. So in the future, we'll get those actual official uh, MPG numbers. I'm sure they're going to be better than the GT. I just don't know by how much. Cool. So uh, I got to fly to uh, Berlin, Nathan. To, to go look at the uh, 2024 Kona. Ah, this is good, yeah? An electric Kona. Wait, why were the Konas in Germany, bro? Uh, because, I, once again, it's that same segment. Uh -huh. And in Europe, that is a very popular segment. So it's, the Kona's selling very well in Europe. So they did this. It's uh, selling like hot schnitzel? Like hot schnitzel, yes. Oh, yeah. Hot schnitzel. Uh, unfortunately, I, was, I flew in, uh, went to dinner, uh, filmed the car, and the next day flew home. That was the... Um, it, I, this, a lot of our international trips are like that. Yeah, um, people th think it's glamorous, but basically the only fun thing I got to do, I went um, to the zoo in Berlin and walked the zoo, which is a very nice zoo, before my flight the next day. You know, uh, there's a band called the Scorpions. They, yes, I know the Scorpions, yes. sure you do. Um, And they have a song called The Zoo. It's great. So, so let me tell you about the Kona. Okay. Um, it's... Um, it's, you know, um, remember when the Cherokee first came out and that picture showed up where it looked so weird in the factory where the main lights were below what used to be the well, headlights? Well, they were one of the first to really do that. Yeah, now now that language has become ubiquitous in some ways. And yeah, the a lot of has that. There's it. like a long, thin line across the front of it. Mm -hmm. And the main lights are below it. And basically, what I think they took kind of what was very kind of quirky design and made it more streamlined. Um, and their goal with both the Kona and the Electric Kona was to um, basically make it a little bit more upmarket. 
Mm, so okay. make it a little bit more expensive. And you get a sense for that. And what they did was they made it a few inches wider, a few inches taller, a few inches longer to give you more space. To give you more space. And then they kind of brought the interior uh, um, inside and uh, well, interior inside, of course, they brought it and made it a little bit more um, streamlined, a little bit, you know, a little bit more expensive feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, it's a new it's a new vehicle. But in some ways, it's more of a you know, because the chassis, I think, remains the same. So uh, they haven't announced this because this is all going to get announced officially for America at the New York Auto Show, mm -hmm. which is coming up soon. Yeah, it is in uh, three weeks. Yeah, we'll be in Moab. You will be in Moab, but Andre will be in I'll New York. Be, I'll be in, um, Andre will be in um, New York. Nathan and I will be in Moab for yeah. the best week of the year, I, I would yeah, I it's, say. Yeah, it's my Disneyland. I'm yeah. very, I love driving in Moab. Um, uh, so, so, so let me finish this. So, yeah. so um, you know, the numbers that I have are... Just, you know, kind of not confirmed, and I'm guessing a lot of these. Uh, so the electric version, I think, has about the same size battery as the outgoing one, mm -hmm. and the powertrain in the gas one is the same as the outgoing one. So I think there's like 20 more horsepower in the electric one, but it weighs a little bit more, and same thing with the gas one. So basically the powertrains are about the same. Yeah, with a little um, bit more oomph. Yeah, and, and the charging, I think, is up to 150, which is pretty slow. That's slow, maybe, or but maybe it's, it's 100, 100 kilowatts. That's it could be. Slower. Yeah, it could mm -hmm. be 100. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're not breaking any uh, new ground, but keep in mind that Hyundai also sells the Ionic 5 and the Ionic 6. So if you want the latest and greatest, those would be the two. Yeah, so the, um, but, the, but the entry level really still is the Kona. Yeah, it uh, lives well, kind of the so point. It, no pricing, but figure between 30 and 40,000, right? Whereas mm, the Ionic yeah. 5 and 6 would be the next. 10,000. Yeah, 40 to 50. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so it looked good. Uh, you know, Hyundai's just on a roll. They are, you know, killing it right now. And I think they'll do well with this. But if you're, you know, if you have the current Kona and you're like, oh, I got the latest and greatest, it's not going to like, you're not going to feel bad about having the latest one because this one is very similar to the one you have. And before we, we end this, I want, you actually brought up something very interesting just now. Um, if we're talking about PR. So bear with me just for a second yeah, here. Sure. It Hyundai Kia Genesis Stellantis, who I've been dealing with recently, um, some other ones out there. Excellent PR. Yeah. Very good communications. Um, they will contact us the minute we have a question, and we often do have technical questions before we print a story or, or do a video on a story. And then they have these events. And of course, we go out to these events, and. We work our butts off. You, you, you're going to see several videos from every single event we go to, and that's because many of them facilitate an area. You know, they're, they're, sorry, they, they make it easier, I should say. They make it easier for video to shoot because it's a pain. It takes three times as long as even basic photography because you have to stage the shot, drive through it, have a little script, remember what you're going to say, remember about the car, drive the car, sample the car, blah, 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 blah. All that's got to be on video. And these groups, once again, Hyundai, Kia, Genesis, and... Stellantis, just off the top of my head because we're talking about them, are very good about that. Yeah, they've really uh, opened the door uh, to video producers like mm -hmm. us because, you know, what we need and what the print journalists need are exactly the opposite. So a print journalist needs to drive the car for 250 miles and get a sense for it. We don't need to drive it, actually. Well, <laughs> we need, to, well, no, we need to drive a little bit so we can tell you, you know, yeah. a little bit about it. But. Yeah, but, you know, like 10, 15, 20 miles, you get a pretty good un understanding of what the vehicle is. And yeah. then you got to spend the time doing video production and doing doing, um, you know, the, the, the hard work that is uh, hopefully a, a TFL review. Nine out of ten, when we go and shoot our videos, um, by the time we're done, we're bringing the last car back to the hotel that we're staying at or the area that we're lo supposed to bring the vehicle to, and we're usually the last to do it. And we don't want to be the car hog, but in order to get these videos, we actually have to hold on to them as long as possible. And that makes it really fun when there's other video outlets out there who also need a vehicle. Fortunately, they figured a lot of that out. So the Dodge event I was at, they had plenty of cars. I love that when they do yeah, that. Yeah, and it was just like fantastic. All right, well, let's get another word from our sponsor before we get to the last third of the show. Yeah, and stay tuned. All right, I got to ask you, Nathan. Mm. Um, when you flew to Asheville, there were horrible storms. There were, oh, yeah. there were planes that were like diverted. Did you, did you, and like people were puking? And oh, somebody passed away. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. so did you hit that trouble, or were yes. you? Yes, yes, I did. And it was uh, the lady next to me started praying in tongue. I, I'm not even <laughs> making this up. What I've happened? had, I've had, I've had people pray near me before in flight, but this one, she was really going, and I could not understand the language she was praying in at one point. Um, and we were, we it was just when we transferred, so we flew from Denver to uh, Chicago O'Hare. And then from Chicago to Asheville. And that's where usually O'Hare is popular for take, getting to the smaller southern airports. 
And the minute we got off the ground, it was already really shaking, a much smaller plane. And by the time we were about halfway through the flight, things got really, really bouncy. One of the uh, compartments above opened up and, you know, drinks are being spilled and someone dashes to the bathroom to vomit and everybody can clearly hear the vomit go, Wah! when we were flying. It was great. Um, our uh, production manager, head producer, everything else, uh, Zach, was on a different flight and he got diverted several times because one of the flights actually had somebody who passed away from, I believe, a heart attack. Uh, not on his flight, but on another flight, and that requires a lot of yeah. you know stuff. I, FAA. I was reading stories about it, and I was thinking of you. And there was like <laughs> one story where they said they looked out the window, and you can actually see the wings like flapping. Yeah, it, you was, know? Uh, <laughs> it, was, yeah. Like, it was like that. Yeah, that bad. Yeah, and and we we dropped. We did like a hundred foot. It wasn't that much, but it feels like a lot when your stomach kind of goes up. I think we dropped like 100 feet very quickly, and, it's, you know, everybody has that in turbulence. But when you mix that with everything else that's going on on the plane, hey, what, it's awesome. Why do they serve alcohol on planes? Be to calm people down? No, it, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire, dude. No, You're not calming people that down. That is an opinion, and there are an awful lot of people, including another lady next to me who was drunk. As a exactly. Why home. are you getting people – you put people in a tube, they're stressed – out of their brains because they lose control, and then you, you know, you, you give them alcohol, which yeah. seems like a recipe just for like people doing stupid and dumb things. Well, I mean, there's you, want, a, you want them to give you know, like edibles? Here you go, get stoned. You know, at least no. I, I don't think you should be serving alcohol on a plane. It seems like a really bad idea. Oh, a really bad idea. They well, make it's not a nightclub. It's I, it, uh, you're right. It, uh, you put your finger on it, right? They make millions off of that. Exactly. It's not a nightclub. It's not a restaurant. It's not a bar. Why are you serving? I'll, I'll give you the worst flight I ever had. Okay, give me the worst flight. I got. I, it, it was typical one of those like the hell of your own making. So I look at my I look at my thing and I get upgraded to first class, right? Yeah. We fly a lot, so we have status. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, score. So first row, which is even better for me because. I'm like Pavlov's dog when I fly, and I hate like when they start to bring out the food. I start to like salivate. Right. And then you, if you're sitting in the back or you're sitting in the middle of the plane, you got to watch all these people in front of you. They're done by the time it gets yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, well, I need food, and I don't really need food, but it's just because I'm bored. And, and I'm, the food is there. And the food is there. Yeah. So if you get the first row in first class, <laughs> sounds awesome. Yeah. So I'm like, yes, get the food, and it's you know, it's not great food in first class. I mean, it's it's, but it's. But you're living like a Vanderbilt. No, you're, it's it's like it's like maybe a step below like good takeout. Okay. All right, all right, <laughs> all right. A step below that, right? All right that, fair that's enough. that's where you're at. And this guy sits next to me, and he starts talking to me, and he was one of these blowback guys who was talking about crypto, right? Oh God. You know what I mean? Just like how what a great investment it is, how much money he's made in it. <sighs> and the flight attendant comes along. Do you want some drink? He goes, Yes, I'll have some white wine, right? Mm -hmm. And Nathan, I am not joking. That dude went. That flight attendant poured two, and these these are small glasses, right? Yeah. Two bottles of white wine down his throat, and. The, I'm gonna, I was going to use a dirty word, just would not shut the you-know-what up. He just kept – and I, I'm sitting there like captive now with this this blow bag, drunk off his, you know, butt, mm. you know, just, just hammering me with his, you know, his crypto success and his his crypto wisdom and his, you know, his, his brilliance. And, and I was like, this is the worst flight of my life. And he would not shut up. Did you have headphones? Uh, he, he didn't matter. Yeah. He just kept talking. Just okay. kept kept talking, and she kept pouring wine, and he mm -hmm. kept talking. He kept getting more and more drunk. By the end of it, he was slurring his speech so that it was, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm like, I paid money to sit next to the drunk guy at a bar, and I'm like, why are you? Why doesn't the flight attendant like look at me? And I'm I'm, I'm like trying to signal her. I'm like, no, no more, no more wine. Cut please, him off. cut this guy off. I am I am now the poor schmuck stuck at the bar with some <laughs> slobbering drunk giving me his life story. I could have sworn that they had a some sort of limit on, on flights but this may how long ago was this like two years ago okay I, I maybe you guys know if they have limits I had a horrible and wonderful flight at the same time with people getting sloshed near me it was around spring break but uh, 15 years ago I was working at vhicks.com and I was flying back from Miami and people who were near me were schnockered and they were dancing I kid you not they were dancing and I got a free dance whether I liked it or not and it was that part was awesome and then shortly thereafter that same person who danced on me literally uh, passed out on me <laughs> I had to fly from uh, Fort Lauderdale no from uh, Miami back to Denver with a person half passed out on me snoring heavily and on the verge of puking the entire time 
But the dancing part was cool. So, you know, you take the good with the bad, Roman, that's all. No, 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 no. I don't, you know, it's, how has this become like taking the Greyhound with wings? You know, there, there's, <laughs> there's like etiquette. And if you're a business follower, you know the etiquette. For instance, right, the etiquette is if you're uh, in the window seat, you control the little shade, right? Yes. If you're in the middle seat, you control the armrest. Kind and, of, yeah. yeah. And if you're in the aisle seat, you control ingress and egress, right? You control access, right? Mm. And, and and these are just the way we have to do it because back when you were flying, people actually had like real seats and there was actually real leg room, right? So you didn't feel like you were like completely squished. You know what I mean? Back, oh, yeah, 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 Right? Sure. There, there was like, back you could actually days. stretch out your feet and people for some reason didn't decide to bring on their, their compressors onto the plane because they didn't want to check them anymore, right? So now everybody's bringing everything on the plane, including their salamanders and geckos and cats and dogs it's just become this like 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 very stressful and on top of that you pour alcohol i don't understand okay. it welcome to tfl flights <laughs> before you are many issues that we have all right, all right. Flying. let's let's go back at least they have pr departments right let's, let's get back to car all right well uh, we're gonna wrap this up with the car stuff yeah so because there's a little bit more at the very end of this video i think what we're gonna do is we're gonna attach a walk around that we took with uh one of the guys yeah, the, I actually have the his poop, name the here. Brian DePup, he's one of the vehicle integration engineers. That is correct. Yes. And so he does a nice little walk around with us. And that is nice because we're actually able to see some of the details in the vehicle. And he'll talk about some of that stuff. So that's at the very end of this video. So stay tuned for that. But before we get to that, let's talk about our favorite week of the year uh, and what we're looking forward to. And that yes. is, of course, the Easter Jeep Safari. Uh, so we've got a couple things going on. Uh, we just bought uh, a uh, AEV uh, um basically uh, upgraded JK, Jeep Wrangler JK. I like to call it the armored JK. Yeah, so uh, I think we're going to take that with us because obviously it's Jeep Safari. So I'm yeah. super excited because this this has a lift. It has bumpers. It has a worn winch. It has uh, really um, cool uh, off-roady uh, look to it because it's that kind of that, that tank color. It's, I think got it's got tons tank. of armor. It's got sliders. It's got a special spare tire carrier that can hold different types of fluids. And, and the best thing is, like I said, it's a JK, so it's from 2016, so we're not. I'm not too stressed about, like, you know, bang it up. That's yeah. it's built to be banged up. Right. So I think we're going to have to go and we're going to have to like do Hell's Revenge or something fun because we usually just go and do something like fins and things, which is great for video, but it's not exactly. It's not that challenging for. Right. Although it is challenging for certain electric off roaders that lose the ability to use their front locker or even front wheel drive for that matter. And and the reason I'm so excited and the reason part of the reason we bought this is because Jeep just came out with the most expensive Wrangler ever. Yeah. Right. So they came out with the uh, anniversary edition. And then on top of that, it's the AEV edition. AEV edition. Yeah. So I'm guessing, we don't know this, but I'm guessing besides the concepts that they have every year, uh, they're going to have one of those there. Which we hopefully will be able to get our and, hands on. And it's got the the one that we, of course, want to drive is not the 2-liter turbo 4 by e which is fine. Yeah, but it is 392. Yeah. yeah, so I think if we can get that eight, our hands on that $110,000 and then compare it to the one that we got. Even the one that we got, dude, I looked at the Dolce on it, $20,000 above sticker for all the... AEV bits and parts. Yeah, so what you do is you, you, back then you would buy one of these and then they would move it over and at the actual location put all the components onto it and that adds the extra $20,000. Um, I'll be there as well, um, bringing the my Hyundai Santa Cruz, which has a new set of shoes on it. We're going to test that bringing, out. You might be bringing the, the JK. I might be bringing it, the yeah. JK? Yeah, because I want to take the Raptor too. Oh, you want to take it? Okay. Yeah. Um, so you might be taking, you might be driving that JK. I might drive the JK, but are you if, okay with that? I'm okay with it. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll we'll figure that out a little bit later. But nonetheless, the the in reference to that Hyundai, it's still going to somehow go out off road and do some sandy stuff and test out those new shoes I was talking about. But the, the JK and the Raptor, nonetheless. Plus, we have another vehicle. I think we have to pick up over there. It's going to be a bunch of stuff going on. And then uh, the other thing that I'm looking forward to, of course, is that they always have some concepts. Now, for the last two years. Uh, they brought out Magneto. Yeah, which is that's their all electric, uh, essentially Wrangler. But it's not it's not what they're going to produce. It's just kind of a test vehicle. But I think at this point, this year, I got a feeling this year we're going to see a real electric Jeep that's going to be almost production ready. And it may right. not be a Wrangler. It may be something smaller, right? Because uh, in Europe they have the uh, what's the smaller one uh, that's electric. Well, oh, you mean the one that just came yeah, out? Yeah, they just came out. Oh, it was like, I wish you didn't pop that on me. I know, Avenger, I know. We keep... The Avenger, the I... Avenger, um, something like that. But yeah, so in Europe, they have an all-electric Jeep. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 can't, I can't fathom 
with two years of kind of like you know teasing us with an electric Wrangler that they, that they wouldn't have an electric Jeep for us to, to drive. They'll have something there for sure. Now, one of the things they've been building up to is they're trying to get us used to the idea of having the 4 by e family increase in size. And they are increasing in size. Overseas, they have uh, two different plug-in hybrids we don't have here yet. And so those vehicles um, perhaps will start working their way over there. I'm referring to the Compass and I believe the Renegade. They have plug-in hybrid versions of. Um, over here, currently, the Grand Cherokee and, of course, the Wrangler. Those are plug-in hybrid capable. And I think that they're going to expand that, and we're going to see some of that. Event Avenger. Yeah. Very good, at Nathan. Thanks. I, yeah. I, I, I haven't had enough coffee, so it doesn't come to me that quickly. But there'll be other stuff there, wild stuff, unpredictable stuff, which is what Jeep likes to do. And the best part is we get direct access to it, and we get to drive it. Though limited, we still get to take it on some light off-roading and figure the vehicle out and give you the behind the scenes with the actual people who designed and built them. Yeah, so I think I think there's some really cool stuff coming, and if we're lucky, we'll get. I hope I'm almost sure we'll get to drive the anniversary edition Wranglers. I'm pretty sure they're. I'm sure have that one. they're yeah. going to have one there, and maybe an AEV version. And we could, if we take ours, we can do a old versus new. That would be really cool, right? And, yeah. And and, and I, you know we we don't have any um, sponsorships with AEV, but I've always uh, loved their stuff because I think it's about as close to like um, manufacturer spec as you can get. That's exactly it, and I think that's why not only Jeep but also General Motors and Ram. Goes uh, well, Ram and Jeep, yeah, but uh, the point is that they, these companies go and use them and well, work Chevy, with them. Chevy, right, with the Colorado. Yes. They uh, also the have Bison. AV. The that's Bison, a, That's yeah. an AEV. That's what I'm referring to. So the point is, is that they are all working within this realm because AEV builds products that really do look, at least aesthetically, so, like they're uh, ready to go. And on top of that, they're very functional. So Tommy was telling me the story where he was just uh, at the uh, Hummer EV SUV drive. And uh, he was talking to Scott Brady, who you know runs the uh, Overland uh, Journal. Oh, yeah. Scott's a good guy. Yeah. And he was telling him what separates AEV from some of the other manufacturers is that, well, let's talk about a bumper. Right? Bumpers mm -hmm. are classic. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of manufacturers will build a bumper. And they build very, very good bumpers. But they build a bumper by basically cutting out metal and then welding it together. Using mm -hmm. great welds, you know, painting it well. Uh, which is fine, nothing wrong with that, but AEV actually has, in Michigan, I guess, giant stamping mills where they actually, the way the manufacturer would do it, right? So instead stamp of, it out of one piece. piece of that, yeah. yeah. So instead of like, you know, building it, they actually stamp it, which obviously, you know, is less corrosive in the long term. They tend to be stronger, at least with the first impact, stuff yeah. like that too, yeah. So so I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, and I like the look of it because a lot of it, you know, and, and I think you agree with me on this. A lot of like people who lift Jeeps do it because it's style over substance, right? Often. Yeah. So it yeah. looks cool, yeah. right? You've got these wheels that stick out like six inches outside of the... Which in many cases is useless on the trail. And, and they're like 22s and yeah. there's, there's no... Uh, <laughs> there's no sidewall. There's no sidewall. And it, it, so it's, it, it looks cool, but it's not going to be functional. Whereas the AB stuff, I think they always put function over f form over function. Form over over style? Function over form. That's also... Yeah, function over form. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. I said it wrong. But yeah. at the same time, their stuff looks good, I think. All right, so, so enough about AEB. So before we get to uh, Brian's uh, interview, uh, when... Um, when are we going to get our hands on this? And when when is a video coming out so that we can actually do right. driving okay. impressions? Okay, so the driving impressions are coming out on the 22nd of the month. Okay, and the Hornet. Yeah, the Hornet RT, that's the plug-in hybrid powerful one. That's coming out later on in the spring, and we'll have more numbers and more information about that. So there's uh, to be uh, announced on that. But the GT, which is the value one, um, which still has really, really high marks in terms of performance numbers, that comes out now. So you can go online to Dodge and actually configure one right now. And uh, I think we got some more Dodge news coming very soon. So yes, you'll we do. Stay forward to that. We can't talk about it yet. I hate I hate teasing stuff, but it's it's going to be big. So uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, Nathan, thank you for going out and reviewing this vehicle. And I can't wait to watch your full review. Yeah, it was my pleasure. And you can go to All TFL now and watch his walk around, which are also great. Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's uh, jump over to Brian and see what he has to say. Adios. Ciao. Folks, I have some good news for you because if you're sick and tired of slow crossovers, we might have a cure for you. And that comes courtesy of Dodge. This is the 2024 Dodge Hornet. And I have one of the guys responsible for this vehicle right here. And we're gonna interview him right now. What is your name and what do you do for Dodge? My name is Brian Delpo. I'm the uh, vehicle synthesis senior manager for the Dodge Hornet. And I'm just really excited to show this vehicle and, and put performance back into the segment. 
Yes, performance. And what do we mean by that? Well, this is actually the top of the line currently, and that is the RT. There's a GT, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But this one, well, this is the big, nasty, angry little Hornet. And the reason why is because what's under the hood. So let's talk about power, first of all. There's two different powertrains. One's in the GT, and this one is the RT with a plug-in hybrid architecture. Yeah. Yeah, so 288 horsepower, V8-like levels of torque, 383 foot pound feet. So, uh, you know, even though it's a plug-in hybrid and you have uh, a little, you know, you have the battery and the electric power, mm -hmm. really focused on performance here. Okay. So we have combined power numbers, right? So mm -hmm. everything is combined. That's because this is a proper plug-in hybrid. 15.5 kilowatt hour battery? That's correct, 15.5. Okay. And what's interesting and was revealed to me is the fact that this one actually has really good balance because you have a smaller displacement 1.3 liter turbocharged yep. engine in there. And then in the back, there's an electric motor. And how much power does that put out? 121 horsepower. Right. And that goes to the rear wheels. And as such, the battery and the gas tank in the back with the engine in the front creates better balance. And that means that, aside from the fact this is way more powerful than the GT, this is also, well, technically a better balanced vehicle, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically when you look at the overall package and how we distribute weight, we're close to, I think, a 40, we're at a 48, 52% mm -hmm. front to rear. So really good, really good uh, front to rear weight distribution. Let's move our way to the back because I want to show everybody what makes this vehicle unique, and that is this little flappy door right here. All right, observe. I shall open. And that, my friends, is what makes it unique. In this class, currently, not a whole lot of options when it comes to plug-in hybrids. And what Dodge mentioned was they aren't really looking at plug-in hybrids for MPG gains as they are for power gains, which is why this thing has ridiculous power numbers. So let's move on over here. Okay. And okay. Gas tank on this side, right? Yep. Okay. It's not going to open it because there's probably a latch or something inside. Yeah, right? it's a, there's a lock. Right? Of course there is. So <laughs> the good news is, is that this vehicle actually has two different forms of performance. It can actually be an electric vehicle, which gives you how many miles of range with the... Just uh, the over e 30 miles of so all over 30 electric miles. range. Yep. It, all right. When utilizing our electric mode. All right. So, oh, we're going to pop in the hood. Here's the good news. By the way, you might be noticing these little things right here. Heat extractors. Yes. They're actually functional. So, ah, there we go. And no idea what I'm looking at right now, which is totally fine because neither do you guys, except for that orange cable. That is a telltale sign of a hybrid system. Everything else under here, and that's totally understandable. Front wheel drive architecture, nine, no, say six speed automatic transmission in this one, which is interesting. We talked about this a little bit. Part of that is packaging and just the way the system works because keep in mind, this essentially is front wheel drive and then power up to 50% of it goes to the rear. Am I correct? Yes, that is true. Okay, so let's talk about the performance modes in this car. What do we got? So um, one thing that, right, we've got, so from a dynamics perspective, we've got, you know, available Brembo brakes, mm -hmm. fixed caliper braking. We've got standard Coney frequency selective damping. And on this package, on this vehicle specifically, we actually have selectable dampers, which you select through sport mode. Right, and that is on the street, or no, that's the track pack. The track pack, that's yeah, right. Correct. Okay. Um, so, you have all that, so this is essentially could be thrown onto the track and driven around hard. Those are Michelins that are on here too, yep. by the way. Um, so we've seen this car, and this is the top end. Let's talk about where everything starts with the okay. GT real quick. So, the GT is uh, our entry level, right? It's our base model, uh -huh. but base doesn't mean base. I mean, it's, you can still get the track pack on it. You're talking 268 horsepower. Um, almost 300 foot-pounds of torque. I, it, again, right, you can still get the Brembo brakes on it, selectable damping. Um, you still have a real sport mode, right, <clears throat> where we control the steering, the, the power steering. We change the power steering. If, if equipped, we change the damping in it. We change the throttle maps in the pedal. Uh, we do some things in the transmission. 
where we, you'll feel punchier shifts, you've got more pressure there. So all things to really make what we call a real sport mode, right? Not right. just the button. Now, this vehicle currently does not have uh, EPA numbers that are available for us to use yet. Yes, Obviously, it's going to be relatively efficient because it's a plug-in hybrid. But we do know about some of the numbers with the GT. Now, for those of you who might be confused, the GT has a completely different powertrain than this. That has a nine-speed automatic transmission, and that one has a rear end that actually uh, takes power from the engine and puts it to the rear, as opposed to this one, which just uses the electric motor. Very, mm -hmm. very different setup. No battery in the GT either. But the GT numbers are actually pretty compelling. If you think about the fact that you get standard all-wheel drive, yep. you get standard the big turbo, all of that comes in that one package.